Hey, everybody. First of all, I want to thank everyone for all their support and tuning in. And without any further ado, my friend Rick Gates is back. Uh, Rick, how are you doing? And happy, happy Thanksgiving again. Yes, happy belated Thanksgiving to you. Thank you very much. And Rick, I want to ask you, I was watching, and I meant to ask you this in the quote green room, but I didn't, uh, but it's a softball. Uh, you were on a show called, um, it's on Fox LA. You were on with Scaramucci. Yes. Yeah, about two weeks ago. And then you said that there was definitely voting problems and that more problems will be found. I'm paraphrasing, of course. Um, and then Scaramucci said, yeah, but he's lost 14 court battles already. Now it's 16. So what do you think about the election? Let's talk just from ground level. The yeah. outcome of the election, your thoughts, and where are we now? Sure. Yeah, look, the, the president's options uh, are are limiting, you know, obviously by the day. And, and the, the biggest obstacle he has against is against the clock. Uh, there obviously have been a number of instances over the this past weekend, uh, even into today with the hearing in Arizona, the certification in Arizona, uh, and now just just before uh, we started talking, the Georgia Secretary of State has ordered an investigation into election fraud in Georgia uh, with at least initially 250 cases. So you know, as we continue to go through the process, and we're still within that window of time where the president is absolutely right and has every legal you know, opportunity to do so, is to continue asking these questions about the election fraud. Uh, but the path is very clear. He has to go to the Supreme Court um, and the, the Supreme Court has to believe that they're standing uh, in the case. The best case that uh, every legal scholar will out there will tell you is the one in Pennsylvania where there's no question you know, that the election law was violated. Uh, the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania has already even mentioned that, but their belief was that they didn't want to disenfranchise all of those voters. So they, uh, you know, made a ruling which is very subjective, and it will be interesting to see how the U.S. Supreme Court uh, rules on that. But back to your original question, whether that's enough to overturn the entire result, uh, you know, there's, there's, we, we've got to continue going through the process. The president's going to continue fighting. Obviously, I uh, believe that he owes it to his supporters. Uh, and to those people that voted for him. And, and as I think as we talked earlier too, I got to tell you, from the day of the election till now, the number of people that believe fraud has occurred in elections uh, is, is climbing every day. And I'm not saying systemic fraud or massive fraud. I mean, we've got to get away from those types of words. You know, my book, Fraud is Fraud, whether you are fraudulently casting 10 votes or 10 million votes, uh, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, a, it's a problem that has plagued our country for decades and we've just never addressed it. So, you know, hopefully through all this, we'll be able to step back and begin fixing a number of these uh, election issues in many of these states. I'm curious to know how, how far one goes with this, because first of all, the president did say that if the Electoral College signs off on it, he will concede. He made that mm -hmm. statement. Uh, but also, I, I recall in 2016, there were similar allegations of voter fraud because of the outcome of the spectus uh, I keep calling her Senator Clinton, but Secretary of State Clinton, uh, Hillary Clinton, when she uh, ran against President Trump, now President Trump, and all of a sudden they stopped and she was willing to concede. Right. What part of this is really the president just not willing to admit that, hey, things didn't turn his way? Well, I think it's a fundamental issue of fairness, and I and I saw this from the you know the, the first day I started working for him. Um, he's not political, he's not traditional, and he looks at things through a much different prism than most of the career politicians do. And while most politicians would say, "Okay, I'm going to concede," the president's saying, "Wait a minute, I don't think this election was fair." Uh, the difference is they need to find the proof, and they've been gathering it. Again, unfortunately, they're up against the clock, not Joe Biden in this case, and so that's created the issue. I think if the president had six months, I, I don't think by the end of that six months, there would be, you know, more than 20 percent of the Americans that believe that election fraud didn't happen. So but but again, because of the Constitution and the way it's set up and, and kind of to go to your first part of your question, there is no way the president can physically stay in office. We have a Constitution. The Constitution protects the sanctity of our democracy and our elections. Uh, and whether there's fraud or not, we can go back and, and investigate that over time. 
uh, and again, hopefully fix that. If the president can find enough fraud between now and uh, you know basically December 14th, which is the real critical date, next date in the electoral uh, electoral process, then great. Then let's see it. Let the Supreme Court deal with it. That's their job. Uh, but that's really where you know we're headed to the stage. Uh, we're, we're running out of time. Uh, I'm writing on Twitter. Gates says real Donald Trump just following up election fraud claims to support his base. Is that correct? Well, it's to support his base and the, the fact that he believes he won. Absolutely. And he does. And I think that's the difference. I mean, other politicians would say, well, I think I won. I mean, Hillary Clinton thought she won, right? And at the end of the day, you're right. Some of those states are close. Uh, she could have contested and she didn't. She had a lot of people around her saying, okay, I'll concede. Uh, and she did. This is the difference. Donald Trump did. He believes that the, there's fraud in the election. So he's going to pursue it. Uh, you know, both for himself and his supporters, no question about it. Is it a case of, you know, to the ends be damned? There are a number of people, and I think you might be know where I'm going with this, who are concerned about, for want of a better term, the sanctity of our democracy. Well, if they wanted to be concerned about the sanctity of our democracy, they should have done it, you know, years and years ago. I mean, again, election fraud has been going on for decades. This is not anything new. Uh, we've had a number of interesting anomalies in this election. Uh, we've had massive mail-in, uh, you know, ballots. Uh, there's a group out there right now, Voter uh, Integrity Project, that I thought has done a great job of gathering facts and evidence. This is exactly what should have been done, you know, much earlier, uh, or the structure put in place where you can physically call people in states and said, hey, we understand you got an absentee ballot. Did you vote by absentee? And then they say, well, wait a minute. I didn't request an absentee ballot. Well, according to this document, it says you did. No, I didn't do that. And then that's where you start digging into the actual evidence and facts that you need to show that fraud. Again, whether it's a thousand or a million or 10 million votes, doesn't matter. The fact that it exists is a great indication of the problems that we have in our country with our election system. And, and the problem with that, Zenny, is that people are going to question the integrity and validity of the results. As many Americans are doing right now. And that is going to create problems for Joe Biden because it's gonna come across that he was not legitimately elected. Uh, he was elected because of the help of fraud and that's gonna stick with him for his four years. And if I were Biden, I think I'd want to get the, the full truth out. If there's fraud, let's talk about it. If there's not, then let's move on. But I think in order to get the facts out, you have to have this kind of you know investigative period. And unfortunately the constitution doesn't really allow for that at this stage. And that's what you know Donald Trump's up against. How does one square with the fact that Biden got eight, over 80 million votes and really still counting if you think about it? Uh, by contrast, Hillary Clinton got more of the popular vote than Trump, but didn't win the Electoral College. Biden's won both. He just cleared Arizona today. And it just seems like this, we'll put my math hat cap on, it's like this asymptotic process. You know, the more you go through it, the more we find that, well, this court throws this out, this didn't happen. The as as you admitted, I think on the other show, the the evidence of voter fraud is really scant. How far do you go asymptotically until you stop? Because if you think about an asymptotic formula, asymptotic formulas never stop. Technically, they're infinite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, at what point do you say, okay? we're going to stop. Is it when the Electoral College, as the president has said, when the Electoral College says it's good, it's good, that's when we stop? Yeah, well, look, you have to, right? Constitutionally, if the Electoral College votes for Joe Biden, then your next date is January 6th, in which the congressional uh, delegations, you know, in the House and the Senate, you know, will then certify the results. Those are the two critical dates. Uh, you know, Donald Trump can fight all the way up to the day of the inauguration, but that doesn't stop the constitutional process from working. And I think that's a major difference uh, that people don't understand. And there, I know there's a lot of talk about whether he's going to physically leave or not. Um, he, look, he's already said he's gonna respect the process and he will, but that doesn't mean that he shouldn't fight all the way up to the last possible moment that he can fight. Because again, every day that he fights, we find out new information. And again, I, I, I caution people to uh, use these terms of systematic or you know systemic or massive fraud. Uh, sure, we could say there may not be massive fraud across the country, but there's fraud, you know, and I don't think anybody would deny that at this stage. And fraud can be simply people receiving two ballots. You know, one of the big issues out there right now is 
People that live in Nevada also have uh, real estate in California. They're getting two ballots and they're voting in two places. Is that legal? Is that ethical? Is that you know moral? Those are the questions that we're dealing with. And this election has brought all that to the surface. And I think it's very important as Americans that we all see that because we have to have fundamental trust in our electoral system. If we don't, then, then why do we have it? Uh, and that's where we got to really look and dig into the weeds and, and understand that process and make sure it is, we are the gold standard and we need to make sure it is a gold standard process. And right now it's not. Wouldn't it be better if someone came along and said, hey, you know what? Or maybe the president himself said, look, I concede, but I'm going to start this new organization that once and for all is committed to clearing out voter fraud, regardless of event. You know, I mean, wouldn't that give his push a bit more legitimacy as opposed to uh, the noise that one hears that, um, you know, basically dismisses him from time to time? Uh, as opposed to saying, hey, look, he's got a real solid issue here. He's starting this new corporation. He's going to go off and investigate this, and this is a big deal. Why not that approach? Well, I think that's the political or traditional way. I mean, if there's anything that we've learned through this, the noise is actually getting to the heart of the matter. The noise that he is creating is getting to these investigations. If he hadn't created the noise, do you think the Secretary of State in Georgia would be calling for uh, an investigation now into fraud allegations? Clearly, he's not just going to do that. There is evidence there that now the Secretary of State sees that they want to investigate. Look, I don't think there's any American in this country that doesn't want this election to be free and fair and transparent. We're not there. And that's the issue. And that's the real issue about how we dive in and, and break that apart and understand what that means uh, for our country. Um, but th there's no American that wants a fraudulent election. Look, we talk about it, you know, we go back to the Nixon-Kennedy race, you know, and and, and there's no question now that there was fraud in that election. And it absolutely impacted the results of the election. Uh, historical, yes, but it's still, you know, reminiscent of the things that can happen in elections and why it's imperative as Americans that we all look at this and make sure that the elections are as transparent and, uh, and, and you know, have as much integrity as possible. Now, I got to ask you, shifting gears a little bit. No, I don't want to go there just yet. I still like talking about this. <laughs> You've been talking for a little little while longer. It's still going on. Oh, it's um, right. Help me with the idea that if you're Secretary of State, I'm thinking about Brad here in Georgia. Mm -hmm. What what would you? How would you feel uh, if all of a sudden the two Republican campaigners for Senate? Kelly Loeffler and David Perdue were attacking you and it seemed like the party was basically throwing you under the bus when you were going by the book. I mean, I feel, I feel sorry for the man. They have protests in this house and all that. Yeah, look, as, as we know, you know, everything's politics, right? Everything's political right now. And, and the elections are, are no exception. And these elections, the stakes are high. Everybody knows it. So, you know, as Secretary of State, you know, it is important that, that Brad continues doing what he's doing. Follow the book. That way, at the end, when somebody says, oh, wait a minute, you didn't do, uh, you know, something correct, he can say, oh, absolutely, I did. I did everything through the book. And that is the important thing for anybody in any of these states. Just follow the law. In Pennsylvania, we saw that they didn't do that. That's why there are problems. In Georgia, I think, you know, the secretary is doing a very brave and right thing. If he were to ignore the voter fraud. I mean, even people in his own election uh, commission have said there's fraud, right? Uh, Gabriel Sterling came out weeks ago and said, yes, there is fraud in our election, no doubt about it. Again, we don't reach to that massive or systemic uh, you know, amount, but the fact that there's fraud, if you're in that position, if I were in that position, I'd want to do everything possible to make sure at the end of the day that nobody had one scintilla of, of reasoning to be able to say, wait a minute, you didn't follow the book. If you had done that, then you would have discovered whatever it might be. And as a result of that, it would have changed the election. The Secretary of State is doing the absolute right thing. You know, it doesn't matter. It's, it, look, it's, it's not changing the, the course of the timeline. Yes, it's an additional amount of work, but better to be sure and correct than to find out six months from now, a year from now, that not only was there fraud, there were multiple types of fraud in Georgia. Why, I mean, I would, I would rather go through the pain now 
then have that be, you know, leveled against me, you know, several months down the road. But it's not going to change the outcome for the president. As of now, I don't think so. I mean, there may be, uh, again, I don't know how many allegations they're going to investigate. I saw the number just before joining you, and that was, uh, I think, 250 specific cases. Um, I don't know what that, they haven't identified how many votes that is. Uh, obviously, as you saw from the hand recount, there was, uh, you know, almost uh, 1,300 ballots added to President Trump because of discrepancies, because of miscounts, because of votes not being tallied properly and added to his column. So that's a perfect example where there may not have been fraud in that instance. That sounds like a lot of clerical errors more than anything else. But the point of doing these audits and going through and doing this investigative work is to make sure each of these states gets it right. And that's important that they do it. I want to shift gears a little bit. I want to talk about what you learned through this campaign from 2016 and now. Here's where I'm going with this, um, Rick. I'm really fascinated with data and analytics. And to me, there hasn't been enough talk about how what you do has been impacted by new technology, new computer technologies, programming, um, and companies like uh, Cambridge Analytic, um, Analytic and so on. What now does one have to have in order to properly run a campaign from a data standpoint? Oh, data is absolutely crucial. Uh, I remember uh, talking to you know Steve Bannon when I first met him, and he he kind of said, "Give me the lay of the land. What do you think?" And I said, "Look, there are two things that that are, it's going to take to win this election. We've got the right candidate. He's got the right message. He's doing that on his own. What we need is data, 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 and we need to understand how to use that data and and target data, uh, target people with the data, and uh, that's in the form of mainly digital ads, social media, you know, platforms, all that type of activity that we did use." And then I said the second thing was a ground game, but the first and most relevant and, and the one that obviously, you know, the campaign ultimately, ultimately did in 2016 that, that prevailed was the data analytics. And it helped us get to voters that were on the fence. Uh, it helped us to intensify the base, uh, you know, for Donald Trump so that those voters would actually go out and vote on election day, which as we talked about is an absolutely key component. So all of those things add up, but it all leads back to data analytics. And I can't imagine a candidate being successful without it today, which is why you have so many pe people and companies out there, you know, uh, involved in it and a part of it. What about the social media aspect? And did um, did the campaign go too far with respect to the allegations regarding uh, the, the firm? Uh, was what could have been done differently that would have kept everything right? you know, between the lines as opposed to maybe going off the rails here and there? Well, I think with social media, I think we're all learning how to use and adapt to social media. I mean, we've learned a lot in 2020 about, you know, uh, yeah. big, tech, big tech companies, you know, censoring social media. And, and I think the social media platform that Donald Trump used, look, you know, I, I remember him saying this, you know, one time on the campaign, he's like, his Twitter, his, you know, ability to communicate with people directly was the single biggest thing that he wanted. Uh, he didn't want a bunch of filters. He didn't want people telling him what to say. He wanted to communicate directly with the people, and and he did. And you can argue whether he did it right, he did it wrong, uh, you liked it, you didn't like it, it doesn't matter. The reality is, is that he totally changed and transformed the way that Twitter was used in a political campaign. And, and I think that's a great example that other candidates have followed and will continue to follow moving forward um, as we get you know deeper into kind of the social media aspects as they relate to campaigns. Hey, I'm going to ask you a question. I think I know the answer to as I mull it through my head, but I'll just go for it. When I got involved with Obama for president in 2000, early in 2006, um, BarackObama.com had just launched. Mm -hmm. And it was a brilliant social media platform uh, along the lines of Facebook that really did an excellent job of bringing people together um, in a way that I have never seen before. And I say that because it's never been replicated, not even by the campaign in 2012. I think because of the troll factor that they didn't anticipate and didn't have the algorithmic tools to deal with then that do exist now. Right. But it seemed like 
something that someone else should do again. I don't know if you were aware of it or familiar with it, um, but do you see a campaign doing its own social media again? Yeah, absolutely. I think, look, I think the in 2008, we were in a much different place with social media than we are today. And I think there are obviously a number of platforms that have given rise to candidates, you know, being uh, able to communicate directly with people. Uh, what Barack Obama did back then uh, has just continued to escalate. It's the same thing that George Bush did in, in 2000, you know, with Karl Rove uh, and his ability to kind of harness and use data for uh, micro-targeting, a very specific purpose. So as you see the, the way that technology is used in campaigns, you understand the importance of how it is modified over the different election cycles uh, and what could happen I, in the future in respect, you know, response to your direct question, I could see somebody trying that again, but with additional platforms. So where Barack Obama used it as his primary outlet, uh, I think that uh, given technology and the number of platforms out there and the way that we use Social media, I think it would be a combination uh, of sorts, but that certainly will, will be one because that lends itself to being able to have proprietary data and information, just like the Trump campaign did its own app in 2020. And it was able to use that uh, very uh, strategically in order to intensify voters, increase outreach, communicate, all that type of stuff that you need for a really robust campaign. Yeah, because you know what's interesting, Rick, about BarackObama.com is that at the time, I was explaining uh, why Barack was going to beat Hillary and people weren't buying it. And they were they mentioned race and everything. And I said, you know what? There's another view of the country you're not getting. If you get on BarackObama.com, you'll see the country's a lot more together mm -hmm. than you think. And it was remarkable to see all these pairings, dates, marriages that came out of it. Um, and it's something that's never been written about. Um, so that's why, and I, without it, I don't think Barack could have won. All right. I, I mean, it was impossible. I would agree. You know, it was, it was something else. And I, I just love to, and I put that out there for anybody that's listening. I think it should be replicated again. And I, I'm, I'm shocked that campaigns on a local level don't do it. Cause I think it would work better on a local level. I don't know what you, and do you do local campaigns as a consultant or, um, no, many years ago, I don't do any uh, any local level stuff now, although I help from time to time. But yeah, I think to your point, it would work very well at a local level. Uh, again, not so much at a national level because of the number of platforms. Uh, just like everything, you know, changes and, uh, and 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 is modified over time, particularly in the technology realm. Everybody's looking for that next big kind of breakthrough uh, on that front, and and so I think you know with Cambridge Analytica that you mentioned. The interesting thing about their platform is that it was based on behavioral predictions. So now we've moved away kind of from, you know, micro targeting that we started in 2000, moving up to Obama and more selectively being able to gauge voters and their opinions based on, you know, their demographics, how, you know, where they live, how much, you know, income they made, their cars, all those different data points that we have. And we've continued to kind of you know, uh, transform and uh, the the models have evolved. So I thought, you know, honestly, there was going to be a lot more uh, evolution in 2020, uh, mm -hmm. 2016. And, and there actually wasn't. There was a lot of tweaking and fine tuning what was done in 2016 and different ways of using the data. But in terms of, you know, kind of any like next breakthrough, behavioral, psychological or, you know, uh, whatever it might be, we still haven't found that next key to what data analytics is going to do. And I think that's going to be interesting because remember data analytics is not just about politics. It's about everything. It's about business, consumers, uh, economics, uh, social, cultural, uh, all of it goes in to better understand individuals as people and where in this, in the case of politics, where their voter sentiment might lie. But obviously the data is used for so many different things right now. And the other question I have that's related to that is, when I have, because you know what I do is we are my clients, but I tell my clients, make your own Twitter accounts, make your own YouTube accounts, put your personality out there. I find them very reticent to do that because I explain to them that if you give it to the media, they're not going to tell the story the way you want it told, right? But you, then you have Trump who basically overstepped the media and he put that out there. Would, is that going to be, and I, I don't know of another way to put this, is that going to signal the death knell of media as we know it? Well, look, I think the media is also transformed, you know, over the various election cycles. If you look back from 2012 to even today to where they are, 
uh, I think it's going to change the media, you know, drastically. I mean, you know, kind of the joke on on our campaign in 2016 and even in 2020, you saw it as much as the media complained or, or targeted Donald Trump, you know, for negative, uh, you know, and fake news, as, as, as many people called it. Uh, at the end of the day, they're still covering them. Uh, frankly, I think the media are going to be hard pressed over the next four years to generate the same amount of coverage, you know, for Joe Biden. I mean, already there's not been, you know, one serious press conference yet, um, you know, with Joe Biden. And I think that's going to uh, be very, you know, uh, difficult and, and uh, the, the media is gonna have a very hard time, you know, finding information, you know, to cover in the news cycle. I think it's gonna be fascinating to see. And on the flip side of that, to your, your, your point, well, let's let's assume Donald Trump does, you know, uh, leave out of office and he goes and creates, you know, what is rumored to be Trump TV or some big media conglomerate. Again, he's going to dominate uh, mm -hmm. that space because he knows how to do it. He knows what to do with it. And I think that's going to be interesting to see if he ultimately does that. Yeah, I'll go a step further. I think a number of organizations are going to lose a great deal of money because, <laughs> you know, look, I mean, I'm a Democrat, but I'm also a technologist. And I just have to tell you that what he produced was a bunch of different talking points or information points on a rapid fire basis every single day that because he was president and can immediately impact ratings for the persons that got it out fastest. And uh, it, it was a phenomenal development that I feel uh, could have been formed into a monetized platform. That's another discussion entirely. But I've, I've watched this with... Um, with a sort of a laboratory eye, right? And um, what's coming out of it, I think, is fascinating. But uh, for traditional media, I can't see traditional media surviving. I, I just can't, unless they, unless they transform, which I haven't seen much of, you know. Yeah. Um, and he he should start his own media company because he would basically suck the wind out of it. And I'm not saying I want that to happen, but. Um, I don't see how it's I don't see how it's avoidable. Do you? Right. No, and I agree with you. He would suck the wind out, and and because again, he knows what he's doing in that space, and he's very good at it. So I think that is certainly something that will be considered, depending on you know what he decides uh, you know to do next. If he doesn't prevail, I think he's going to continue fighting. Uh, and as you see, he has dominated you know the airways. I feel like I've seen more on election covers than I have on you know Joe Biden's new cabinet, uh, mm -hmm. and I think that's telling. You know, I think it's not lost you know on a lot of people. Uh, but I do think that, you know, the, the, the Republicans need to look and think about how they're going to address the media in general moving forward. I know there's a lot of complaining that the media uh, has, you know, uh, not covered, you know, Trump favorably. And now they're giving you know, Joe Biden a bunch of softball questions or, you know, treating him as if he's, you know, the savior of America. And, and look, I think it, one is going to come back to Biden. But two, the Republicans need to stop complaining and they need to go out there and they need to build. Uh, these media networks, they need to build a narrative, they need to build a voice. Uh, and the more that they do that, the stronger they're going to be. We can't sit back and just, you know, complain about what the Democrats are doing. That's not going to work. You know, something else, too, that I think anyone watching uh, should heed is that the media in the future should cover how government works. Because the one thing that I feel we've lost in the four years is the, is an appreciation for governance. How, as a person who went to school to be a a right. plan to work in government, how government works, how the sausage gets made. I mean, policy level. I don't mean the name calling all this stuff. I mean, how we make sure that Mr. and Mrs. Brown get their community development block grants, mm -hmm. that sort of thing, which is fun for me. You know, and I think some kind of way that should be made. I just figured it out, Rick. There's the new way. Well, just make it fun for people to consume that stuff. I just yeah. think I figured it out. Well, just look at now. Look at the look at what we're learning about our own constitution. We haven't we yeah. haven't you know done a deep dive on our constitution like this in, uh, you know since like the eighteen hundreds. Uh, yes. You know, awesome. and, yeah, and, and and that's important. I mean, this is great. I mean, I think this is this is democracy in action, right? This is you know democracy in a living form. So the more people say, oh, you know, Trump should concede, I love the fact that we're just playing this out to see you know what, what could happen. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure you did it, but. Uh, others, you know, Joe Biden hurt his foot yesterday. What if it not been his foot? What if he had not been able to be inaugurated? What happened in my mind? Like, yeah, let's play that out. What do you think? What would have happened with Kamala be our president then? No, interestingly, again, constitutionally fascinating, right? Our founding fathers obviously were given some thought to this, but if a president elect or somebody that had been selected as president uh, does not meet 
the uh, date threshold. So let's say, you know, for whatever reason, Joe Biden hit his head, was incapacitated, or, you know, and couldn't, uh, you know, be sworn in. If he, if this happened before the Electoral College met in uh, or meets on December 14th, then the DNC could actually submit another representative to be voted on by the electors, or the electors could choose to vote for somebody else. Uh, same thing, the Speaker of the House, they could push for another name. So now you go, let's say Joe Biden made it past the Electoral College. Then you get to congressional certification on January 6th. If something that happened to Biden be between those two dates, then again, the House of Representatives controls the process. The only time that Kamala or Kamala would have been uh, named the, the, the president is after the congressional certification on January 6th. So if something had happened to Joe Biden between January 6th and January 20th uh, of 2021, then she would become uh, the president. Uh, under no other circumstance would she become president. I thought that was pretty fascinating. Yeah. Has, has this happened before though? What's that? Has this happened before in our history? No, not in the history of our country. Because because I'm thinking when came, we came with, to 1800, you know, was the, the race with uh, Jefferson Adams about um, you know, how the, the Electoral College uh, made its pick. There's some, you know, obviously political shenanigans behind the scenes. Uh, and, you know, we know what happened in that race. But uh, absolutely, this is where, you know, the Constitution does matter. And it's great that people are learning about it. So you mean to tell me that they could turn around and make Barack Obama president again? The DNC, in theory, if something happened between yeah. now and December 14th, could nominate another individual. That's absolutely right. Now, the electoral voters, the Electoral College would have to select him. And there's obviously some, you know, legal issues there. Maybe the electors don't feel obligated to do so. Um, you know, they're pledged to a specific candidate, in this case, Joe Biden. But maybe they decide, hey, you know, Joe Biden won, but he's incapacitated. So I'm not going to vote for him. I don't feel obligated to vote for him. And then a whole other set of issues uh, kick in. But yeah, absolutely. According to our Constitution, the DNC could absolutely nominate anybody it chose uh, to uh, fill that place before December 14th. See, now everybody's going to be watching him like they watched Gerald Ford. Remember Gerald Ford would hit his head. He was clumsy and all that stuff. Exactly. It's going to be the same thing again, but a Democrat or the Republican. It'll be like a Biden, Biden watch, right? To see what right. happens. Yeah. Like a Biden foot watch. Right. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> see, hey, you know, we just figure out a way to keep it going. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll be all right after all. <laughs> Crazy process, but, you know, you got to give credit to the founding fathers. They thought through a lot of different scenarios that, you know, most people wouldn't have taken into account. Genius. I got to ask you, my friend. Um, pardon. I sure. know if the president offers a pardon, you'll take it. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, who wouldn't? <laughs> have you heard from Have you heard from him? No, uh, I've not heard. And we're not actively engaged in that process. Um, although I think it's absolutely warranted to all of us that were involved in the Mueller probe. Um, I think it's uh, an, an absolute tragedy what Mueller and his prosecutors did to attempt to get to Donald Trump. They used us to try to get to him and they failed. And I think, you know, when they predetermined the conclusion without having the evidence and then tried to go look for the evidence, it was very telling. And obviously we know a lot more today than we did, you know, three years ago. And now with the advent of uh, classified material being declassified and other information coming out, uh, it clearly shows, you know, an instance where that's, you know, been very uh, problematic. That's the, that might be the president. Uh, what's that? That might be the president. No, I don't think so. Hold on, I'm sorry, one second. Sure. Yeah, let me just, yeah, there you go. Yeah, sure, no problem. That happens to me all the time. Um, if he doesn't offer a pardon, what will you do? I mean, um, look, uh, hold on, sorry. When that happens to me, I always just turn my phone off. That was our yeah, turn because yours is hooked to the computer, what? right? You, you, you must have a uh, yes. Yeah. Mr. Gates, is that you? Yes. Yes. Okay, one second. Oh, that's that's your other person. <laughs> oh, uh, hold on a second. You've got. Uh, I can't. Your mic is muted. Hold on a second. You mute. You muted your mic. Yeah. Rick's muted. Muted his mic, so he's having a conversation, folks. So we are. So he is um, trying to straighten out his uh, 
other call there. It looked like he had a um, person on the line. There. All right, Jenny, I think I think we're uh, technology resolved. Talking about technology. Cool. We had another. We had another, a third disembodied voice there. <laughs> but hey, uh, so back to the question regarding what you would do, and you, were, uh, you didn't get a part. Yeah. Look, really quick, I, I hope he does it. I think it's warranted, uh, but it's obviously his decision, and I think he'll make you know the best decision uh, for all of us. And he knows the sacrifices that we made. He knows the pains that we went through. Uh, simply being, you know, uh, you know, part of his team and part of his orbit. Uh, and there's nobody that understands how much he's been attacked, uh, you know, by you know forces within government, individuals, bad apples, uh, than him. So I think it's very important. Uh, that you know, uh, people see this, and 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 that um, you know, he looks at it holistically. And look, I mean, you know, people said he's done a bunch with pardons. I mean, Barack Obama gave 212 pardons and 1,700 clemencies. So you know, and, and, and obviously, past presidents have done the same. Um, and and I think the the president is absolutely warranted in this case. And 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 frankly, given everything that we've been through in the Mueller investigation, which turned up nothing, uh, has been you know the real problem. Before we go. No, one, another question. Um, then we talk backstage. But the Biden transition team is looking for people to work. Would you be interested in the position? No, my, my, my policies don't align uh, with a, a Joe Biden. Certainly, I think his party is going to be at civil war when the progressives, you know, start, uh, you know, getting a lot of pushback and don't get what they want. And they believe that they were a big part of Joe Biden getting elected. So it's going to be well, interesting. Well, I ask as a person who's invited to sit in on a big meeting regarding the transition team and who's been invited to apply to be in the administration, they told us specifically, we don't care if you're Democrat or Republican because they they want, yeah. they want, they want to unite everybody. So that's why I'm saying. I, hey, I don't think that's necessarily going to be put into practice as much as it is as lip service. I mean, that's easy to say. Other presidents have done it before, too. But I don't think that's going to be you know, necessarily the issue. But, it, but it's fun to try. You got it. Absolutely. I think you should do it. It's good. <laughs> All right, my friend. Hey. Uh, good to see you. Great to see you, too. Got it. See ya. <laughs> so that was Rick. He had to go. Uh, we're going to talk him backstage, but I think he's got um, he's got something going on there. But at any rate, um, Rick Gates, as you may know, was um, special. Uh, he was a special witness uh, to Mueller, uh, Robert Mueller, and um, he um, was deputy campaign manager. Uh, for the uh, the Trump campaign in 2016. So a little um, well, a little bit of a background on him here. Um, there is this uh, Wikipedia entry. Um, that's Rick. Um, and he said he pled guilty to conspiracy against the United States, making false statements. In the investigation into Russian interference in 2016 United States elections, he is a longtime business associate of Paul Manafort and served as deputy to Manafort, wherein the latter was campaign manager of the Donald Trump campaign in 2016 um, after Kellyanne Conway. And it says Gates and Manafort were both indicted in October 2017 on charges related to their consultation work with pro-Russian political figures in Ukraine. Additional charges were filed in district court for the Eastern District of Virginia on February 21st, 2018. However, these charges were withdrawn February 27th, 2018, without prejudice as agreed in his plea bargain with special counsel Robert Mueller. On December 17th, 2019, Gates was sentenced to 45 days in jail and three years of probation. Uh, he is the son of a retired Army Lieutenant Colonel Richard W. Gates Jr., who is founder and CEO of the Gates Group International, a management and information technology firm based in Prince George's County, Virginia. Uh, he's an Army brat and um, met his wife in college at the College of William and Mary. He got a degree in government. Uh, and so is, is talks more about his career and, uh, you know, He's been through a lot, 
uh, and uh, it's a good guy. And the Ritz says, have, uh, have you worked with Rick Gates on professional level in the past? Uh, no, I have not. Um, seems like you guys know each other. Well, this is, uh, seems, well, it's not, this is now the fourth interview we've done, I believe now. Let me see how many we've, we've fourth interview. So after that much exchange, uh, yeah, you do get to know a person. And um, I think the one thing that we share is, well, several things, a love of country, a love of politics, a love of government, uh, appreciation for governance, you know, um, for how the sausage gets made. Um, government is fun. And I don't mean, when, I, when I'm talking about government, I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about government. I mean, how departments work, budgeting for the department, getting money where it's needed to do a policy, making sure you have enough money to do that policy, making sure that the government's edicts are carried out. I can go on and on and on, making sure you have the right people, which is critical, okay? Making sure those people have an appreciation for governance, which governance, the simple definition of government, governance, excuse me, is how things are done in the government, how a bill is written. Do you know how bills are written? Most people in the United States, I found, don't even know how bills are written. Most people in our country don't know or understand governance. They have some feel for the politics, okay? But when it comes to how government works, so they don't know who their council members are. They don't know the number to call those persons. I can go on and on and on. But the mother's milk of government is money and pro that is one thing and process is the other. Process is the child of governance. All right, process is the child of governance. So anyway, there you go. So yeah, no, I, I like Rick. He's a good guy. You know, um, he'll he'll be back. So anyway, subscribe to Zinni sixty two bookmark oaklandnewsnow and thanks a lot, folks. I'll see you.